recording goes out, it's just going to be recording my face. So you can decide whether you want to zoom in on what I'm doing or whether you want to have it on gallery view where you can see everybody else that's in the group as well. So by way of introduction, um, the next three weeks, we're going to be talking about um, old wives' tales. Hello, Sue, great to have you here. So there we are, full house. I'm just counting there, it's just, yes. I can see five pictures because I'm the fifth person. I was getting confused there for the moment. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about old wives' tales. It's something that crops up in the Facebook group every now and again. And to um, perhaps if you want to leave a comment in the chat button, what your favorite old wives tales are, or if you've got any old wives tales that you want to um, test out um, for suggestions. I'm pleased that you can hear everybody, Mary. Well done. I know you're having some problems this morning on the Facebook Live, so that's good, thank you. So, um, you know, whether it's about putting aspirin in the water, you sometimes hear about that, or adding lemonade to a vase of flowers, or bleach. Even my husband yesterday, he was taking an interest in what we were doing, and he was asking me whether I'd seen a YouTube video on how to make your own flower food, and I was saying, no, I hadn't. And he was busy giving me the recipe of a teaspoon of bleach and two teaspoons of sugar and whiz it up together. So I just wondered whether there was anything else that sprang to mind that you'd heard about and whether you wanted to give it a try. So the, the only problem with giving things a try is you need, if we're going to do it scientifically at all, to have a sort of control where we um, did exactly the same flower arrangement but didn't do give the flowers the same sort of treatment. So I think we're going to have to suspend our belief for a while and just um, observe their eyes and, and you know, use that knowledge that we've had for how long you would expect your flowers to last. So boiling tips. So um, that is really good and I will come on to that later Sue because as you can see I've got roses in front of me and the boiling tip does work really well with them and Lynette as well. I'm going to write these down so this is ideas for next time. So boiling and lying flowers in water to revive them. Boiling and a flower bath. So it always seems whenever you try one of these um, sort of old wives tales, unless you've seen someone else do it before, it can be really unnerving and quite, um, you know, you have to sort of take a leap of faith really because you don't want to spoil the flowers you've already got and you'll be sitting there thinking well you know is my rose okay as it is or does it need a bit of a, a treatment whether it's lying in the bath or giving it a water shock treatment and and because you don't want to waste the flower that you spent good money on but I would say that I have tried well I've certainly tried the boiling of the flowers it's not actually boiling, you're putting the stems into boiling water or very hot water at least. And that has certainly worked. And the um, reviving roses in a bath of water, um, I have done that for um, gerbera and it's worked really well. I don't think I've ever done it for roses. And the other thing with that is, of course, when you've got your flowers and you need to lie them in water, and I'm saying bath of water because I know that my flowers won't fit in my sink so you would actually have to physically take your flowers upstairs into the bathroom and put them in the bath of water and then tell no one else to take a bath and Joan's saying she doesn't know too many old wives tales it depends on how old they are um yeah and suggesting that hydrangea being dipped quickly into boiling water and left overnight works for Joan a treat so it's just having the confidence to, to have a go. So I thought today I have brought my hammer with me and um, the tale I want to discuss with you is about whether we should be crushing the woody stems of flowers with a hammer and giving it a good old bash to help it take up water. So has anybody, um, you know, lots of, Sue's saying she knows loads of old wives though. <laughs> So have you ever heard about that one, about taking your flower stem and, and, and walloping the end of it? So Joan's saying she's heard of that. And again, this sounds counterintuitive. And in fact, we will debunk this myth by the end of the video. But of course, I won't be able to tell unless I do it. And I put one rose in a vase that I have treated normally and one rose that I have bashed about a bit. So the, the, the saying here is that literally you do bash the stems. Now I thought this was so old fashioned and so debunked as a myth 
that nobody could possibly do this anymore. But I was on um, one of these floristry groups on Facebook and quite an um, uh, you know, experienced florist said he, um, he was bashing flowers and I can't remember which flower it was now. And I commented, oh, I thought the thing was now to cut with a really sharp knife. And he said, no, I've been doing this for 30 years with no problem. And I can't remember the flower it was. I don't think it was a rose. It might've been I don't know, dahlias or something like that. It sounds a bit too um, brutal an action for a dahlia because that's got quite a soft stem. But you'll find that in lots of the old fashioned flower arranging books, they say, take a hammer and two, crush the end of your stem. So can you see there that it's all come flattened out and it's started to splay out and the idea being that when you put that in water that it's got a more a greater surface area in which to take up the water and in theory prolongs the life of the flower. Now modern day florists will say that the um that crushes too many of the stems, there's the cells into the flowers. And really at this point, it's almost like we need to become biologists and really understand plant materials and, and, and how they work. And as flower arrangers and florists, we don't really um, know much about that. We can read up about it, but it's not um, part of what we do. Yeah, Joan's saying the poor rose. <laughs> yes. It has got absolutely bashed, but actually I will say if the, if the point was, to splay out the um, stem, it certainly has splayed it all out there. And I can see that that, you know, is certainly, you could understand that that would be taking up water. You could understand the theory behind it because it was um, opening up the whole of the stem and making um, the, 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 the parts of the stem take up water. And I can't remember now if that's called the xylem or the phloem, I'm going back to my O-level geography days, of you know, the stem structures, that might be a really good thing for us to look at. Perhaps we almost need to have a biology lesson to understand how flowers take up water. But this is, you know, look at any of those black and white flower arranging books that you've been collecting, um, you know, the ones you pick up from your flower arranging, um, from the charity shops and things like that. And I bet you, they say, to, to, to crush the end of the stem to aid uptake of water. So for me, I, I feel a bit nervous about that, but I'm going to make a flower arrangement today, and that's going to be my principal method of um, trying to get my roses. Well, half of the roses to take up water, I'm going to crush them, and the other half, I'm going to use um, my scissors in the very conventional way and to recut the stems at an angle, because modern day convention says that you want to have a really clean cut here, clean in the sense of a nice sharp cut, where you haven't crushed the flower stem, you've sliced it open and you've created that new wound because the end of the stems do tend to, even when they've been, they've been out of water for a while, they do dry up at the end. But even when they're in the vase, they do seem to sort of um, constantly trying to seal themselves. I guess it's part of the healing process of the stem, which is another reason why when we refresh the water in our vases, after a few days, the practice is to recut the stems at the same time. So you're constantly got this sort of new wound that is, is the water is, is going up through and if you are a you know a really avid flower ranger and you know perhaps aiming for floristry you might even be cutting it with a knife so i don't know does anybody use a knife to cut their flowers with you know it's sort of quite a it's almost like you're paring vegetables you take your um a, a proper floristry knife and you would i don't think it's going to work like that but you sort of pull Pull the knife against the stem like that and that gives an even cleaner sharper stem than a pair of scissors and that's the other reason why we need to use um, a pair of scissors that are really strong scissors to cut your flowers with now i was trying to when i bought these flowers on sunday i couldn't be bothered going to find my floristry scissors so i thought i'll just get the kitchen scissors out and do it and actually my kitchen scissors although they look really sturdy weren't strong enough to cut through the stems and if you're having to struggle with a pair of scissors and you can't cut, you'll end up that you're squashing the stems together and you're not getting that nice, clean, sharp cut. Mary is saying, could you split the rose? And actually that might be an idea. You do your nice sharp cut and then take a knife and slice the stem in half for a few centimeters. So you'd end up almost like with one of those dolly pegs, you know, that you've got a pair of legs on. That would be a better way of doing it, I would say, 
and um, damaging the cell structure. I have found that, like all these things, it's trial and error. And unless you're ranging roses a lot and you're noticing that they are declining quickly, but probably you'd never use any of these techniques. But perhaps if you're using particularly woody stems, perhaps if you're doing church flowers, you know, church flowers have to last forever because the budget is very small, that you might decide on your woody greenery there to recut and then slice down a little bit. That would be a way of doing it. Joan's saying she still needs to learn the trick with um, slicing with a knife. It's quite good fun to do that. And it's quicker if you are a commercial florist, it's quicker because you can just do it in one hand instead of always putting your scissors and cutting and putting them back down again. But I always use scissors for teaching because I think it's a bit intimidating if you see somebody um, using a knife, but it is quite a nice trick to do it. And you're remembering when you're using a your knife, it's um, you're not sort of sawing through and quite a, and a trainee florist um, have a, a plaster on their thumb in order that um, they're not cutting through. But it's like pairing vegetables. If you sort of get used to action, I mean, I use a potato peeler, but if you peel potatoes with a knife, it's that same sort of action that you'd be using it. And I would say that, um, like everything, it's the fear of doing it that puts you off, but um, practice makes perfect. So I am going to do an arrangement, primarily in water, because I'm trying to steer away from using flower foam. It's because it's not so good for the environment. And also because my supplies of flower foam are running down. And I, as you know, I still haven't really got out to the shops. So in front of me, I've got my old breadboard. I've got the, the knife from the DIY toolbox. And I've got these absolutely beautiful roses. So again, I have been out to buy roses. And aren't they gorgeous? So these are pretty much standard fare for supermarket roses. They are on quite nice stems. And another thing to think about when you've got your roses is I haven't really conditioned these properly in the sense that I recut the stems, but I didn't take off any of the greenery because I wanted you to show I wanted to show you the flowers as they originally were. And you can see here that that bit there needs to come off. I don't take all my greenery off though when I condition my roses. Sometimes there was a fashion, particularly um, for wedding bouquets, where every bit of greenery was taken off. But I have read recently that you need to keep the, some leaves on because they are part of the process of sucking the water up through the stems. And again, it's that sort of crossover between flower care and biology. But you can sort of understand how that works, that we're talking about trying to get the, flower to, the water to the flower head. We don't want it diverting off to any unnecessary leaves, but it's probably true that we need some leaves on the stem in order for that continuation of water and keep rising up through the plant. That was how it would happen in nature. But now we've cut the flowers off the rose bush. I don't know to what extent that's true, but I can kind of understand the thought process. Again, I'm not a biologist, so perhaps this is another area of study that we need to explore together. So I would say don't take all your leaves off the flower stems. They look quite nice with a few leaves because they look pretty, but also they possibly, let's err on the side of caution, they have got um, a biological effect on the uptake of water. So you would need to make sure that if you are conditioning your flowers, you recut your stems, bash them with a hammer if that's what you choose to do. And perhaps one day you might decide to you know, buy a bunch of roses. How much did these cost? Probably five pounds in the supermarket. My husband threw away the receipt, so I don't know how much they cost. But it may be you split the bouquet, split the flowers in half, and you do one half cutting, recutting the stems, and you do the other half bashing them and put them together in a vase and just compare and contrast and see which lasts better. I'm going to put, you know, I've already sort of put the pie pot on that because I think research tells us that bashing of the stems destroys the cells in the flowers and it doesn't actually help water uptake. So shall we get on with the flower arranging? And I will stand up in a minute. I've got a bucket of flowers behind me as well. I have picked up some pink asters from the supermarket. So um, we were talking a bit about on Facebook Live this morning about whether the supermarkets actually had a good range of seasonal flowers or whether they sit to the all year round favourites. But you do tend to find the asters are stocked in the supermarkets over the summer months, as are gladioli, which are in season at the moment. And I've got some lovely pink asters and they also come in a very dark purple, almost like that sort of Cadbury's purple as well. So they're worth looking out for. So in front of me, I have got, I'm going to put that behind me for a minute. I have got um, a footed bowl. So again, I can't tell you where I got it from. It would be a charity shop find. A nice green bowl. Green works really well with any kind of, of flower. Um, if you're trying to colour coordinate things, you don't have to think about it because it's just a, a leaf that goes with um, the flower. So we're used to saying green with our leaves. 
I've taken some chicken wire and I've mushed it up into a rough bowl, taking care not to scratch my fingers. It's got um, cut ends in there and I need to weight that down. So I have got some um, of the floristry tape and normally we would use this to our flower frame in place. But I do need to hold this down. If I had more time, I might wiggle it through the, um, the, the mesh of the wire. But for speed, I'm going to go straight over the top and to hold that down and hope it doesn't spring back up again. And I'm going to do a cross. Normally, I don't do a cross of tape because... Quite often you want your focal flower to be in the middle of your mesh. The reason why I'm crossing over today is because it's just the time consideration when I'm trying to show you this. Ideally, I would have had two um, parallel lines of tape, but I, I could just envisage it was going to spring out of my bowl before I could do that. So I've got my mesh in there. It's rising up above the container. I've got a couple of sharp ends I'm just tucking in and then I'm going to add water. So the thing I need to do when I finish my arrangement is to make sure in terms of workmanship that I can't see these bits of tape anymore. So because it's green on green, they are slightly disguised. If you had a white container or a brighter and lighter one, these would just appear as real sort of you know, no-nos. So just before you finish um, doing your arrangement, just think, have I covered up my tape? And of course, you don't want to see any of the wire work either. So I am pouring my water in here. So in theory, my flowers should last longer because it's arranging flowers in fresh water. Although flower foam takes up water, it, um, it does clog up the bottom of the stems. So it, um, it, it works really well, but I just think flowers prefer to be in fresh water, which is another reason to arrange them in fresh water because they will, in theory, last longer. But all these things, it's trial, error, depends on your circumstances. The difficulty of arranging your water is it's not transportable so if you were gifting flowers to a friend whereas if you had something in flower foam you know you could carry it around to their house when you've got something in water you can't imagine there's going to be water slopping everywhere so just because i'm not using flower foam doesn't mean you can't you make your own decision based on your circumstances so i am going to um put my flowers in now i'm going to put my roses in first of all normally i would always put my greenery in first but as we're focusing on the roses i'm going to get those in first of all and then i'm going to come back and complete the arrangement sort of in reverse normally i like to put my green in first so i can establish how big everything's going to be and then come around so i'm going to start off with a short flower because we want to have something low that's focal so let's get bashing actually i'm going to bash this on my worktop oh, i walked it to do it on my knee my water's gonna look it's just it just looks awful and then having bashed that i've then got to get it into my container so you can imagine if i was arranging in flower foam that doesn't really work when we talk about arranging in foam you've probably heard me say that you need to hold your stem a bit like a dart or if you're writing and you push it in now here i haven't got a fine point to push in it's just the mush it looks like I've um, you know, boiled some string beans and they're just boiled over and you know, they've just started to disintegrate. And even though I've got quite a lot of holes in my flower, in my mesh, um, at some point I can, I can just imagine that um, it's going to be tricky getting those flowers in, which is why I'm putting the main flowers in first of all. So I am doing, I'm doing a primary cut just to cut it off the length. I'm taking off a bit of the green. And then on my lap, I have got my um, breadboard. I'm whacking my stem and then putting them in. So we're creating a little sort of rose bowl effect here. And off to the side, I am, I'm not just um, randomly putting this on the floor. I do have my compost bin. Now here, I'm going to have to take off that leaf because it's going to, otherwise it's going to get stuck into the water there. So bash, 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 bash. I'm putting it in like that. And I can see there, as I'm starting to put it in the flower foam, it's caught up on the, um, the chicken wire. So I think, as I start to put the stem into the, uh, the, the chicken wire, it's caught up and it's all going all over the place like that. So again, it's quite messy. And I can feel there's bits of the stem that's starting to shear off and it's, it's not looking very good inside the vase. And then I've got, once you've got bits that are sheared off, that's then sitting in the water 
and that's going to start to rot and decay. And as you know, that our watchword for everything is clean stems in the water because you don't want these leaves um, starting to rot and then attracting the bacteria, which will shorten the life of the flowers. So let's try another flower in there, quite mid-length. I'm going to bash it on my knee. Poor old flower. I, mean, I guess it's good if you're in a temper. You can, I'm just trying to work out from there where I should put it in. It's a bit difficult arranging flowers in reverse because I can't actually see. And there's a bit that's actually come off. So I've got loads of these little bits that are starting to come off and they are floating around in my water, which is not a good thing. So having to, I'm just going to put that down. So one, two, three, four have been bashed. Let's get some in in the normal way. And it's quicker because I can just cut them. They slide in because I've got that point. And I don't have to think about this because I, I point and I push and they are in. So shall we go for four this side as well? So I'll need to remember when we come and look back at this, you know, next week, that's one, two, three, and four at the front there which was which. So in theory, this half of the arrangement should last much better than the roses in this half of the arrangement. So we'll just have to wait and see. So we've got, I'm going to put those back in that water there. Just stand up, reach behind you. And there are the rest of my flowers. So these are the, let's have a look. Those are the asters I was talking about. So you can get them, in, I think you can get them in white as well, and this cap is purple. And then I've got a few bits from my garden. As you know, I don't have much in my garden, but you can see, even when you don't think you have much, there's, there's still bits there. I've got some privet. I've got the ruscus left over from the Freddy's flowers. I've got some fennel, which smells gorgeous. And some, the privet is the golden privet there. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So for me, I'm making this arrangement the wrong way around. I'm doing flowers first. And, um, start to fill in on the gaps here. So this is quite good. The asters are quite good because when they are, haven't flowered yet, they have got a, that good, lovely rosette form and they sort of do that dual role of being a flower and a bit of foliage, which I quite like having that. In. Although you want to cover up the, the mesh, you don't want everything to be too busy. And that's always the problem when you're arranging flowers. That you, you need to cover up your mechanics and you don't want it looking too busy, so you, you want to have some, you know, nice calming bits of greenery. So I can use this as a, as a, as, as the buds as a bit of green, and then have the flowers as, um, you know, in their own right at the top. So there, we start to put some flowers in. So it's all very pink, and I quite like the yellow here. So my colour scheme originally, that's why I've gone on the yellowy side of greenery, because I wanted to pick up, and you want bits of the arrangement to talk to each other. So we've got obviously the connection between the green leaves and the green bowl, the pink and the pink, and then the yellow is sort of left there on its own. And that's why I have gone in with the um, yellowish tones of the greenery. So perhaps when you've got plants in your garden that aren't very well, you know, they, we have a choicea that's gone a bit yellow and sometimes our fatsia goes a bit yellow. I think it's because of nutrient deficiency, but you can use that instead of fretting about it, we'll use that with your yellow toned flower arrangements and um, it'll just bring everything together. You can see here I'm coming in really low because I don't want all my flowers to be on the top surface and also as the flowers sort of nod over the edge of the container, that's covering up that bit of tape. Um, and Joan's saying asters look very similar to chrysanthemums, they do, it's, it's that sort of daisy format, but they're definitely not chrysanthemums. Can I pull you out? them they are they are they are different but yes it's that sort of daisy like form and actually i don't know if you can see that they've they've got loads more petals they look almost i mean i know sue was asking about helichrysums they've almost got the look of the helichrysum that is a multi um petaled flower but they, they're not um the helichrysums also known as a straw flower so they are definitely a soft silky petal rather than um, a straw flower which is, looks dried even when it's fresh. And I can see a gap here as well. So I've come in short 
and fill in that little gap there. So all the time when you're arranging, you're looking for the gap. And I'm, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do the back. <laughs> this is just going to be a, a cheats arrangement today. I'll fill up the back later on. Um, but you're looking for it to, to have the flowers evenly placed and something dotted around. So even here with two kinds of flower, it sort of looks like an okay arrangement. And part of that is because the, um, the third element is the aster that hasn't actually opened yet, which gives you that calm area between the flowers. So it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle. that You've got flower green, flower green, flower green. And remembering to cut some short to, to, to bring your eye into the container. So it sort of marries the container in with the arrangement rather than having everything stuck up as a cut and plonk flower arrangement. So I'm going to put those asters aside for a moment and then come in with the lovely um, greenery from my garden so I can make use of that. So, I have got, this is the yellowy um, privet, which I wasn't entirely sure was actually supposed to be yellowy privet or whether it's gone over. I've got fennel. So this, the bright yellow flowers have gone over time, but it's probably only, I can see a couple on there, but it's almost getting ready to get to, to the seed and I have put in a couple of these um, sedums because they have a pink flower and for me you can't see it but they're just starting to come out so again it's that nice transition between full-on pink and then petering out into something paler and paler and it's about making all these interconnections you don't have to have loads of flowers to do an arrangement you just need to work carefully with what you've got so I've taken off the stems there and I shall put a little bit down there, it probably needs to be marginally shorter. I'm not actually measuring up, so I'm at a slight disadvantage. I'm going to aim that down there. Just a little gap there. Like that nestled around. So, you know, you can have a look and, you know, is it adding something? Does it need to, you know, does it take away from what I've done? But the more you add in, the more luxurious certain your flowers are. Um, so I think it sometimes is easier to arrange with loads and loads of flowers rather than working to a budget where you haven't got much. But just goes to show that from two supermarket bunches, and I've only used half of each so far, you can still do a really great display. And then with the um, fennel, which smells absolutely gorgeous, I can have that hovering above. So it sort of talks a little bit to, it's like a lighter weight version of the sedum there. So um, again, it's all that sort of interconnection. They're all having a little conversation in the vase and talking about it, that they've all got something in common and that's something they can share and bring to the party, so to speak. So a little bit over there as well. And then, as I say, I'm, I'm only going to do half an arrangement, otherwise we'll never get through to questions at the end. So we're probably nearly at question time. And again, a different form. So these are, you know, I've said about the fennel replicating, repeating the shape of the, um, the sedum. You need different shapes in there as well. It's almost like this is written in normal text and I've written the sedum in bold. You know, it's that difference when you type a letter, if you want to emphasize something, you do a bit in bold. And that's what the sedum and the fennel are doing together. So I might, on there a little bit just sort of lengthens things out not quite sure you can see that and a couple more stems around at the other side so i'm probably going to leave it there for the moment i will finish off later on but for the moment i'm going to fake it and pretend that i have done um the full arrangement and if i clear away that mess you should see it more clearly on the table like that. So again, I don't know, if I'll bend away, hopefully you'll see it, but I'll put a picture in the group when it's against the, the black wall. Um, Joan's saying, it looks really pretty. Oh, thank you. <laughs> she said, she can see that I'm an expert. I